Well then, it, um, our next speaker is uh, will be quite a departure from some of the topics we've had over the past few years at Astro Assembly. Don Refke comes to us as a retired engineer from what used to be called Hamilton Standard in Connecticut. And um, this is the guy that you really, in the early years of the space program, and you were a kid thinking about all those things kid thinks about, th kids think about doing in space, and all those questions that really mom and dad would not rather have to answer, this is the guy who would have the answer to all those questions and many more. And it's a delight to hear Don speak because he introduces all kinds of challenges to life support in space that most of the rest of us don't even begin to dream of. And as you can see, he's brought some uh, gadgetry along and uh, to share with us. And so it gives me a great pleasure to have Don here today, and I hope you will help me extend him a warm skyscraper welcome. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Okay? And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. You all got me back there? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yes, I like to move around a lot, so I talk this way, that way. I get in front of the speakers, so I talk, have feedback and everything else. I really want feedback from you out there because for the last 40 years, I've been working on basically life support systems for space. I grew up on a farm in Wisconsin, and all yeah, right, we had 35 milk cows, the old Holsteins and all that stuff, and uh, I never dreamed that we'd be going to the moon or those places. In fact, I'm probably just out east here too, maybe they said the same thing, but we would relate impossibility to going to the moon. You ever heard that phrase? If you couldn't lift that bale of hay or do something like that, you tell your buddy, I can't lift that because that's impossible. That is like going to the moon. Anybody heard that? Yes, yeah, see, that was even out in the Midwest. So anyway, for that was my concept when I got through the Navy and got into the space world at Hamilton. But fortunately, lucky to get a job at Hamilton Standard. Now it's Hamilton Sunstrand. And you can take that off because, yes, I wanted to show the suit now. <laughs> okay. the, 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 the tape does not stick to the Teflon. Teflon kind of was used a lot during the Apollo days. But anyway, I'm gonna, uh, that time uh, I had a chance to work at Hamilton and kind of we kind of wrote the book with NASA to live in space. And we have no environmental control in here, but all we got to do is raise the, uh, the outside, get a little wind through here. But... We can't do that in space. You've got to bring your own environment with you. Of course, there are a lot of other problems, too. I'm going to talk about a lot of things today, and I hope I touch on what you want. Once in a while, I'll stop, and you can ask some very poignant question or whatever it is, and I'll try to touch about three or four different things. I'd like to touch on this shuttle a little bit. That kind of tells you the mechanics and the, the difficulties to get into space. That's like the space truck. That's the stuff you got to bring up there to do your thing. Then I got to talk about life support, in, like the spacesuit. The spacesuit is made right across the uh, near the Connecticut over here, and we're very proud of that spacesuit. I'll tell you the details of that. That's the world's smallest flying flexible spacecraft, and you are going. <coughs> Can I ask you a question? How fast are you going in space with that spacesuit? Wow, you are going 17,500 miles an hour. Now, if you do your math, how many miles per second? Don't look at her. Divide 3,600 3, into it, and you get 5 miles per second. So if you live 5 miles from school, how long would it take you to get to school? One second, you got it. You can work on your homework for the ten minutes at home, right? So anyway, that's I'm going to ask questions of the audience too here. Okay, so you got to keep alert. Okay, um, talk about the spaces. I'm going to talk about basically life after liftoff. What do I mean by life after liftoff? Kind of what happens to your body. How you do things like brush your teeth and comb your hair. And guess what? Dr. Flush will be here in a little bit. Never get a nickname that you can't live with. Do you have a nickname, Scott? Yes. Okay, I won't tell anybody. <laughs> but I worked for about 10, 15 years on developing a waterless commode, cosmic, cosmic commode, for, uh, for the space station. Uh, where, you know, anyway, where NASA said you can't dump anything to space and all those neat things, there's no water up there, so it's pretty unique. Okay, now, then I'll talk about the future a little bit. Uh, 
and uh, what have you. Maybe like uh, some of the planetary probes, whatever, if I have enough time. Okay? So the shuttle, I have a little cute picture here, but if you want to take your grand, you know, your grandkids someday to, uh, to uh, the moon, you want to go to a busy land moon, you may want to, there's no water up there, so you got to sit on the beach all day and look for hope for water. Anyway, so uh, well basically, we'll talk about the shuttle a little bit here. The shuttle is a very complicated piece of machinery. I'll just go through real quickly. A lot of people know about the shuttle. Oops. But uh, this is, uh, we, uh, Hamilton Sunshine, we also provide the life support system and the cooling system, and the UTC has the rocket system and all that pot. We're very deeply involved in the shuttle program. I call this an 18-wheeler in space. It's a truck and a taxi. Is the truck about 30,000 pounds of stuff, 20,000, depending upon the orbit. Anyway, this is a pressurized cab. Okay, the shuttle has to do three things. Very good. It's like a transformer. Your brother have a transformer toy at home? Is that a brother? No. Oh. Some of these young kids have transformer toys. And they got transformers from a robot car to a robot man to a dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this has to transform to three things. It's a, it's a rocket launch vehicle. That's the first thing. After nine minutes, that's how long it takes to get in space, it has to transfer its shape into a space vehicle. After about 13 to 17 days, that's its spec for sail in space, it has to change into a landing vehicle. So it has to do three things and do them safely, obviously. We've had some difficulties, as you know. Uh, I give talks at the Chris McCullough Planetarium up in uh, New Hampshire a lot. And uh, it's, a very, uh, it's a very deeply involved. We're, our job, basically, is to keep astronauts alive in space. So you know, your job is very important, too. Anybody that builds stuff on the shuttle is very important. Okay, the shuttle takes off 55 million horsepower. What's the power in your Dodge? <laughs> in hamsters. In hamsters. Okay, you got 55 million horsepower. What happens is just about seven, seven seconds before launch, they turn on the three liquid engines. They take fuel, hydrogen, and oxygen from the one half million gallon tank, okay? And they, they, what they turn these on, and you see it just in the TV camera just before they launch, they check out all the sensors. Just like what happens when you turn your ignition key in your car. You, you check out, you, you got the sensor lights come on, okay? What happens is within seven seconds, you got 2,000 sensors they got to check out. If any one of these sensors does not operate properly within a high and low limit, they will, a computer will shut it down. The, the humans can't do it fast enough. So now after seven seconds, when this thing comes, uh, everything's checked out here, then you tease there, then you have launch. At that time, they turn on the boosters. Okay, now you have liftoff. Okay? These two boosters, of course, help uh, boost the uh, shuttle along with the three liquid engines. After two minutes, these come off simultaneously. Get my rocket catcher. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Do huh? they throw them in the ocean? Yeah, no, they do. <laughs> <laughs> they come off simultaneously. In the nose cone, you got parachutes, obviously, drogue chutes and parachutes. And at that time, they are basically, uh, they're a hollow, so they come down the ocean, they fall, fall in the ocean, and they have to, they land in this, they, uh, they're in the ocean in this attitude, about with the nose sticking out, so they can find them out there, about 200 miles off of Cape Kennedy. They have to seal the bottom, and they pump them there, and they turn them over, and they tow them back to Cape Kennedy, and they reuse, reuse them over again. So these are reused over and over again. The shuttle then continues, you don't see this too often, continues going up into, uh, trying to get to how fast? 17,500 17, miles an hour, okay. Anyway, <laughs> I'll, you'll be drummed into that the number today terribly. Anyway, so just before they get into space, just before you get to orbital speed, this tank is jettisoned, okay, and this falls back into the Earth through the atmosphere and burns up over the Indian Ocean, halfway around the Earth, by design. That's where you want it to fall. You don't want to fall on Moscow or any of those places. But yeah, that's the orbital plane, okay. I'll just set this right here. Then the shuttle has two little booster rockets inside with the fuel on board here, and this kick it into the final orbital uh, uh, velocity of 17,500 miles.